fact that what's happening in Vegas is not staying in Vegas because it's the kingdom of God and it's the power of God. You know, that's, that's the powerful thing. God takes any of us and uses us for his honor and for his glory. Praise God. Praise God. Now, there's a lot of things I want to share with you today. But let me just announce something very special that's happening. I talked to Pastor Paul Goulet this uh, last week, and uh, we've been praying about when to do this subject. Sex in marriage is an act of worship to God. And this is a subject that uh, we need to talk about more in our churches. And uh, Pastor Paul and Pastor Denise are a thousand percent behind this topic. And so what we're going to do, okay, related to, to uh, South Campus, okay, first of all, let's go to the Summerland Campus, Sunday evening, August 16th, Sunday evening, August 16th, because it's going to take two services, one will be in the morning, one will be in the evening, Sunday evening, March, August 16th, I will be sharing for about 20, 25 minutes on the subject, Biblically, all right, biblically, why sex in marriage is an act of worship to God and how the devil has tried to drag it down into the mud. And so here, especially in Las Vegas, the sex has been dra dragged down to the gutter when it's one of the most beautiful, pure, and holy things uh, that, that God has created. And then on the following Sunday morning, right here, I will be here to give you the, 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 the full-blown version of this thing. This is for singles, it is for married couples, it is for everyone. You need to hear this message. And so on August the 23rd, I will be sharing Sunday morning on this thing. Okay, so August 16th uh, in, um, in uh, Summerlin Campus. Yes, dear. Uh, no, no, it's, it's Sunday the 23rd, I will be here, right, okay, for today, I want you to turn to Acts chapter 18, you know, we're living in really crisis times, you, the Supreme Court has recently made some declarations, and, and instead of being interpreting the Constitution, they have moved towards uh, uh, making the news and dictating to the morality of our country. We're looking at a time of economic, uh, uh, very slow economic recovery, and many people are still struggling financially. We're looking at a time where families are falling apart in record numbers as never before, not only in America, but it's happening around the world. We're looking at America that some people are calling a post-Christian nation, that no longer are we living by Christian values, we're living by some kind of secular values, those challenges, and I want to say to you as believers, there's a, there are two routes that we can go. One is discouragement and despondency, and the other to say, this is God's opportunity for this hour, and we believe this is God's opportunity. So today, I want to talk to you about climbing the mountain of opportunity. Say opportunity with me. Opportunity. Praise God. I want you to turn to Acts chapter 18. This is on Paul's second missionary journey. Paul's second missionary journey. Verse 1. Acts 18 verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. There he met a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all Jews to leave Rome. Paul went to see them, and because he was a tent maker as they were, he stayed and worked with them. Every Sabbath he reasoned in the synagogue, trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching, testifying to the Jews that Jesus was the Messiah. But they opposed Paul and became abusive. He shook out his clothes in protest and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I'm innocent of it. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And then Paul left the synagogue and went next door to the house of Tizius Justice, a worshiper of God. Crispus, the synagogue leader, and his entire household believed in the Lord. And many of the Corinthians who heard Paul believed and were baptized. One night the Lord spoke to Paul in a vision. Do not be afraid. Keep on speaking. Do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one is going to attack and harm you, because I have many people in the 
this city. So Paul stayed in Corinth for a year and a half teaching them the Word of God. There is so much in this passage that I want to share with you. But let me bring you back to Corinth. Corinth is the third largest city in the Roman Empire. If you look at a map, Corinth is on a, is, is a land bridge, okay? The, the ships did not want to go to the south of Greece because the south of Greece was full of shipwreck. The, the sailors didn't know how to take, handle the, the winds and the currents of, of the sea. There was a major, major piece of literature written by Homer years ago, the Iliad and the Odyssey. And it talked about every time the ships went down to the south, the sailors thought that there were the, these, uh, these sirens singing to them and they got lured to them and there were shipwrecks left, right, and center. So what happened, Corinth became a seaport city, even though it wasn't really a, a, a normal seaport city. There was about 3.75 miles from east to west. It was a land bridge. And the sailors, instead of going all the way to the south of Greece, would prefer to take this land bridge. They had a log, logs stacked up against each other, and they would pull the ship on one side, repair the ship, and pull it all the way to the other side so that they would not have shipwreck. So you understand, this became a seaport city. A lot of uh, Navy people would be there. Now at the same time, you had all kinds of sin in this city. Well, you had the Isthmian Games, which were something like the Olympic Games, so it was like a, a big city. It was like a, a major city, but it was a sinful city. They worshiped the goddess Aphrodite, which was the goddess of fertility. And she had a thousand priestesses. You talk about ministering to the prostitutes. These prostitutes actually were plying their trade in worship to their goddess, Aphrodite. They thought it was their religious duty to seduce men and therefore bring them in soul bondage to Aphrodite. Do you understand what I'm saying? So they actually thought it was their religious duty to do that. And so you saw all kinds of, of prostitution, immorality, and everything happening there in, in Corinth. Now, there are five steps that we see right here at Corinth that we need to learn to climb the mountain of opportunity. Okay, step number one, be flexible. Somebody say flexible. Flexible. Be flexible. You see, here Paul the Apostle learned to be flexible at every point. He had, before he had come to Corinth, he had gone to Athens. And there, they were so superstitious, they had gods to everything. They had gods to this and gods to that. In fact, when he came to Mars Hill, he found a little uh, uh, area, an altar, to the unknown god, just in case we missed all the other gods. All right, there was some god. And so he said, hey, this is the one I want to tell you about. You don't know about Jesus Christ. He is what you worship as the unknown god. He is the real god. He is raised from the dead, and he, he is Lord. He could even quote some of the Greek philosophy. In him we live and move and have our being. That comes out of Greek philosophy. But he understood it enough to say, I want to use even what you teach to show you only Jesus Christ can really give us life. Only Jesus Christ can change our lives around. So he was flexible. To the Jew, he could speak as a Jew who really understood Jewish thinking. To the Gentile, he could speak like a Gentile because he grew up in Tarsus and he knew Gentile thinking as well. Now the important thing, folks, we are living in difficult times in America today. Somebody say amen. You know, we really are. It's going to be very hard unless you understand these principles on being flexible. You need to be secure in who you are. Do you, you know, last time I came, I screamed, do you know who you are? And if you know who you are, if you are built solidly on the word of God, then you will not be shaken. You see, but what you need to do is be secure in who you are, so secure that you can reach out to people that are different from you. We are not fearful of what's happening out there because we know who we are. If we know that we're solidly grounded on the word of God, then we can be flexible and reach out 
to people, all right? If there are people that have different views on sexuality than we may have, we don't panic. We can still love them in Jesus' name. We can reach out to them. If there are young people, teenagers, maybe even our own sons and daughters that might suddenly be exposed to all kinds of things in this world, we can hold steady in Christ, still show the wisdom of God, and still reach out in love and understanding and help them walk through the crises that they're walking through. Somebody say amen. amen. We don't get locked in, you know, like many times as I pastored, my wife and I pastored in Singapore, and we were related to the Grace Assembly in Singapore for 25 years. We have so many people locked in. Some, some man say, well, I'm a Chinese father. <laughs> well, wait a minute. I thought you were a Christian. We are Christian fathers first. We are Christian mothers first. We are Christian husbands and wives. We are Christian singles. Somebody say amen. amen. You see, when you're secure and you know who you are, then you can maintain your convictions and yet be flexible to say, how can I reach people for Jesus Christ? Christians today need to learn to be flexible. You know, uh, as Paul had not come into Europe yet, it, he was in Asia Minor. He wanted to go north to Bithynia. If that didn't work, the Holy Spirit didn't let him. He wanted to go south to Ephesus, but the Holy Spirit didn't let him. All right? So he said, okay, I'm going to be flexible. God, where do you want? And then he saw the vision of the man in Macedonia, and he said, come over to help us. So he was flexible to move on over to Europe. If the Jews reject, we want to reach the Gentiles. You see, he was at all points flexible. And at this point, in this passage, God said, I have a harvest here in Corinth. There's a lot of persecution from the Jews, but don't worry about it. You stay faithful. And he was flexible to stay faithful. She stayed there a year and six months, uh, longer than anywhere else in his ministry up to that point, because he was flexible. All right, that's step number one. Step number two. Step number two, rely on the Holy Spirit. You see, the challenges ahead are too big for human strength. When I look at Las Vegas, I'm saying, oh, God, have mercy on us. This is too big for even the greatest genius, even the most smartest person, even the, the person with the most talent. It's far beyond all of that. Paul came to Corinth in fear and in much trembling. He was not eloquent. The, the Corinthians were, were great on public speaking, and he had never taken a public speaking the way the Greeks had, had learned. He was facing immorality. He was facing uh, uh, superstition. He was facing all of these things. In fact, when he came to Corinth, there was a strange doctrine that they had to face. I'm going to give you a big word, and then I'm going to explain it, okay? So don't, don't, don't get snowed by the big word. The teaching at Corinth was what we call in theology overrealized eschatology. So, whoa, what does that mean? What it means is we have already arrived. These Corinthian Christians said we don't even need resurrection because we have the revelation from God. We don't even have to die. We're going to just go right up to be with the Lord. We have a spiritual language that the rest of you ordinary people don't have. We don't worry if somebody has in, commits incest with his father's wife because that's only in the flesh. We've already arrived. We don't worry about lawsuits before unbelievers. We don't worry about going to the heathen temple worship and, and, and food with them and eating food offered to idols in the temple worship because none of that bothers us. We can do all the sin we've already arrived. Whoa, whoa, my brother, my sister. That's what Paul had to encounter there at Corinth. And so he learned the challenge is too big for human strength. I came not in eloquency of speech. I came not in my own strength, but in the word of God and demonstration of the spirit of God. You and I need to open up to the Holy Spirit. We need to say, God, I am not capable, but you are all capable. God, you can help me to touch people in ways that I could never touch people. Let's begin to pray. Let's begin.
begin to pray like never before. Prayer is what sets the, the, the power of God free. And that's what Las Vegas needs is prayer. We need to pray like never before. Yes, yes. Number three, number three, don't walk alone. We can't fight this battle by ourselves. It was very interesting. Paul had just come from Athens. He was discouraged because some believe but not many people believe. And he came to Corinth because he knew this was the strategic city that God had called him to. He, he, he strategized and, and, and Corinth would have been the, the key city. But, but now he comes. And amazingly, and it seems by accident, how many of you know, in the kingdom of God, there are no coincidences. It didn't happen accidentally. But as he comes into Corinth, he meets a young couple, Aquila and Priscilla. And guess what? They had just been kicked out of Rome. They were persecuted by the emperor Claudius, and history tells us that at that point in history, that, that the emperor, the Caesar, had kicked out Christians. He had kicked out people because of one called Prestas. In other words, there was persecution against Christians. Aquila and Priscilla were kicked out of, uh, of, of Rome, and they decided to come into Corinth, and it just happened they came when Paul came, and it just happened that they were tent makers just like Paul was. Did it just happen? God brings people your way. Learn to work with people. Learn to build the team together because we're not going to do this all by ourselves. Amen. He had left Silas and Timothy up in Philippi and Thessalonica to try to establish the church because he had to leave so soon out of persecution. They came down. When they came down, that freed Paul to say, now I'm going to fully preach the gospel. I'm going to spend all my time getting this gospel out. As he shares... Pythias Justice, he is a, a, a God-fearer. He comes and joins the team. Then he's preaching in the synagogue, and the synagogue ruler, the synagogues in those days, were very open, open to hearing any speaker from outside. And the synagogue ruler came to know Jesus Christ. Crispus, the synagogue ruler. Then they voted in another synagogue ruler, and he too became a believer, Sosthenes. And then they became part of the team. Amazing, amazing things of what God does through each of us. You see, each of you have a different background. You have different perspectives. You understand different languages. You understand and you come from different cultures. But you know, when we work together and we minister together, we're going to see some powerful things happen in the kingdom of God. Not all of you will be preachers. Not all of you will be singers. Not all, but we are all together the army of God. We're going to claim God's victory when we work in unity together for the glory of God. We cannot do it by ourselves, but we can do it as we work together with our fellow laborers in the kingdom of God. Somebody say amen. amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. So Paul is going to say here 18 months. Number four. Number four, be strategic. Be strategic. You see, Paul saw two things. Corinth, key city, third largest city in the Roman Empire. Ephesus, fourth largest city. Well, this is strategic. Las Vegas, strategic. Yeah. Say it with me, strategic. Strategic. Because what happens in this city is going to impact the world for Jesus Christ. That's why my wife and I came to Las Vegas. Yes, we have a daughter and her family here, but we could have gone to anywhere. We could have gone to uh, where our daughter lives in Colorado Springs or to Azusa, but we came here to join hands with you, to join hands with ICLV to say, we're gonna touch our world for Jesus Christ. And right now, Las Vegas is highly strategic. Then he came to the synagogue first. Why? Because, first of all, God's commission there was go to the Jew first and then to the 12 Jewish men who knew the Old Testament. And he knew that he could show them that Jesus fulfilled the prophecies of the Old Testament. 
And so they already had that foundation. And he knew that if he could win them to the Lord, he would already have a foundation for the glory of God. He came to Corinth because the big city was a center of commerce, of education, of communication, of influence. And I tell you, Las Vegas has had a lot of negative influence in America. And I think it's time that Las Vegas has a positive influence on America. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. He wanted to be strategic with everything that he, he did. You know, I've said to so many people, I have opportunities to preach anywhere, everywhere, teach and all that. But the key word that God puts on my life, strategic, strategic. Be impact, impactful. We all have one life to live. Let's learn to be strategic. Let's ask God, where can I best touch my world for the glory of God? My ministry may be different from anyone else's ministry, but I want to be strategic for the glory of God. Henry Blackaby puts it this way. Henry Blackaby is this outstanding Southern Baptist pastor who says, I do what I see the Lord doing. I do what I see the Lord doing. And, and, and as the Lord opens up certain doors and helps you to reach certain people, then you will say, hey, that's what God is doing through my life. I will pursue that direction and I will touch people in that area. It could be students on the campuses. It could be the down and outer. It could be the highly educated person. But God works through you. And Henry Blackaby says, I do what I see the Lord doing. See where there are responsive areas. Some areas may be hard. Try, sow seed, but then see what the Lord is doing and reach out in those areas. Make your life impactful for the glory of God. Amen. Let God interrupt your thinking. <laughs> All right, I say this to everyone because we get stuck in a rut. You know, failure is trying to do the same thing time after time and getting the same results. You get nothing happening. That's a, you're, you're stuck in a rut. Okay, let God interrupt your thinking. Paul the Apostle learned this from the beginning. On the Damascus Road, he was firm, hell-bent, literally, on arresting Christians, causing havoc among the Christians. And God interrupts him on the road to Damascus, and he sees a light from heaven, and he's thrown off his animal. And, and, and God says, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? And Saul says, why? Who are you, Lord? Okay, who are you, Lord? He's really confused here. He knows who he's praying to, but he wasn't quite sure what was happening there. And Jesus says, I am Jesus whom you are persecuting. God interrupted him there. Yeah. And then, as he's on his, after he's done his first missionary journey, on the second missionary journey, he wants to go to Ephesus, he wants to go to Bithynia, he wants to go south, he wants to go north, but the Holy Spirit doesn't allow him to. Then he waits on God, and God says through the angel, come over to Macedonia and help us. Bring the gospel over to Europe. So God interrupted his thinking again. Now here in Corinth, he's really discouraged. He'd been discouraged in Athens. Not too many people believe. Now he had such persecution from these Jews who had come and followed him. And Saul, uh, or, or Paul, Paul the apostle, wanted to leave. But God said, I have many people in this city. All right, open up your mind. God is going to use you here. And he establishes a strong church. Uh, church flowing in the gifts of the spirit here at Corinth and he stays one and a half years. Your obstacles may tell you quit. How many of you have ever heard the Lord uh, the, the devil say quit? You know, he's saying that all the time. He tries to tell you you blew it. He tries to tell you it is useless. But you know, your mountain can become your greatest opportunity. I could spend the rest of today telling you how God interrupted my thinking. But I want to go way back to when I was teaching Bible college in Canada. I was the academic dean and I was the dean of students. I was two deans at the same time. All right, unless you think I'm boasting, my wife keeps me humble. In Chinese, the word dean, dean means crazy. So 
so I was doubly D. The students in the Bible college were seemingly so restless. They were so rebellious. They didn't want to follow rules. They were playing jokes, practical jokes. I don't know where we get the term practical jokes. They're not practical. <laughs> right. they, they, they were doing all kinds of negative things on each other. And this had no place in a Bible college. So I, I as the dean of students, called all the students together. And I was going to let them know the wrath of David Lynn. <laughs> okay, don't have to laugh. Not to laugh. The wrath of David Lynn. And I still remember, you know, God has such a wild... I was going to tell them, I was going to give them what for. I was going to tell them, you should be doing this. You guys are ridiculous. I was going to scold them and, and to whatever I knew how to scold people. But I, I, I said something was very different because I was rushing back from an appointment and I wanted to grab a, a, a hamburger. So I grabbed the hamburger and I ate it while I was driving and the ketchup spilled over my tie. At that point, we wore ties. And, and, uh, and I said, God, what's going on? So I took my tie off and I sat right about where Pastor Frank was sitting and I was waiting. We sang one or two songs to wait for everyone to get together. And then as I got up, I stood up just ready to give them what for. The Lord says, love them. So wait a minute, Lord. I've already prepared my speech. I was ready to give them the wrath of David Lynn. I was going to lay it on them and lay it on them hard. And you're telling me to love them? What am I going to say? So between there and here, I had to suddenly change what I said. And suddenly I just got up there and I said, you know, guys, I was gonna get this, I was gonna scold you, I was gonna, I was gonna tell you every I was gonna I share with you my anger, but God just told me to love you. And I wanna I want you to know that all of us as teachers at this Bible school, we're here because we love you. I have received at that point offers at 40% higher salary at another Bible school. And I said, any of our teachers could be paid a lot more. But you know why we're here? We're here because we love you. And we're here because we want you to be able to graduate and be go into ministry without going into deep debt. And, and you have here some of the finest scholars in all of the assemblies of God. You have some of the greatest writers in the assemblies of God who have written books and, and all of it. But we do it because we, we love you. And suddenly the Holy Spirit began to take over. And student after student began to get up and confess their sin. One student said, I was about to leave by next week because I was just feeling so awful about the situation here. And then another student said, I was so critical about our teachers or our fellow students and, and I want you to all forgive me for my attitude. And the Holy Spirit began moving in that, in that congregation, and we just began to pray. We prayed for a couple of hours together, and after the time of prayers, revival began to break out on our campus. One African brother got up, and he said so wisely, he said, now we have identified the enemy. Ah, yeah. And we know the enemy was not the students, it was not the faculty. The enemy was the devil, and revival took place. Interestingly, the revival carried on the next several days on the campus, in the classrooms, and even in the chapel. We had a speaker come the next day in chapel. He was as boring as you can think about. <laughs> you would fall asleep on this, on this one. It was a, a pastor who was preaching a sermon and preached about 50 years ago. And, and, and then, I, after he finished his sermon, we all went to our knees in prayer. And he said, well, what did I say? You know, it wasn't what you said. It's what the Holy Spirit is doing. And God, the Holy Spirit can work when he can interrupt our thinking. Because so some of us are stuck in a rut. We need to let the Holy Spirit interrupt our thinking so that we can see the revival, so that we can see the work that God wants us to see. You know, when I was in Singapore, I went through a stage where I went through a period of major depression. The people never knew that. Only a few close to me understood that. But I said, God told me to stay. And in that staying, 
the church began to grow. And the church began to grow. Do you understand? Let the Holy Spirit interrupt your thinking. You may think you have been unjustly treated. You may think you're going through some of the deepest trials of your life. But through that, there's opportunity. And we can claim our opportunity as believers. And we can claim God's mighty victory in our lives. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Father, in Jesus' name, I thank you for this South Campus. I thank you for Pastor Frank and Pastor Linda. I thank you for the team that is here. I thank you for what you're doing through this great congregation here. I thank you for what you're doing through ICLV all through Las Vegas and throughout the internet and around the world. Father, I pray that we will not at this time back off, that we will not retreat, we will not give in, we will not give up, but we will rise up and do what Paul the Apostle did. We will learn to be flexible, we will learn to rely on the Spirit, we will not walk alone, we will walk together, we will be strategic, and we will let God interrupt us so that we can be what God wants us to be. God, I declare your blessing is upon this congregation. I declare we are going to touch lives for Jesus Christ. We will win people, whether one by one or family by family, we will bring them to know Jesus Christ. And we will begin to see an impact in our area of Las Vegas for the glory of God. And we will see that impact take place and spill over into our families and into our workplace and into our school. And in the midst of our hurt, we will find the healing of God. We will find the power of God and the blessing of God in our lives. With every head bowed and every eye closed as we come to the close of this service, I want to challenge you. This is the amount of opportunity that we need to claim for our lives. God loves you. God loves you. But you need to follow those steps to climb those mountains. And when you follow those steps, you're going to see God doing a greater thing in your life than ever before. Some of you may be here that are so stuck and you say, I don't even believe God exists anymore. I've been going through so much trial. Or I'd rather just live my own life. And you've said that for so long. But today you would say, I know that I need to give my life to God. I need to let God interrupt my logic patterns, interrupt my thinking patterns. I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. Are you here today? You raise your hand and you say, Pastor David, I want to get right with God. I want Jesus Christ to come into my life right now, right here, today. I want a new beginning, beginning, beginning today. Would you hold up your hand anywhere all across this congregation? Hold it up high. I want to pray for you. In the wonderful name of Jesus. Yes, God bless you, my dear sister here. I see your hand back here. Yes, are there others of you? Are there others of you? How many of you, you may be going through crisis and the devil may be trying to defeat you right now and say, give up, give in. But you have heard the word of the Lord for you today, and you will not give up, and you will not give in, and you will rise up in God's strength and God's courage. Just raise your hand before the Lord as a testimony. Amen, 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 amen. Let's stand together. Let's stand together. Praise God. I'm going to ask you to come. My brother standing on the front line Trying to provide for your family All my sisters Raising those babies by yourself This one's for you God's Egypt I'm looking up